may panahon nga ako mag-auga sa akong pagsimba kanimo o Diyos ko kung akong hinungduman ang mga nabuhat mo dili ko makapugo pagkai kanimo been in a Christmas pageant or play. I, I remember I was a little shepherd, you, you know, carried some of the, uh, one of the gifts. I think I had gold that I was bringing and uh, mother had put me in a bathrobe and put a towel around my head. <laughs> I was a shepherd. Um, when Isaac was just a boy, probably eight, nine years old, we took him to Universal Studios and bought him a Spider-Man costume, which he wore. He was six. Yes. Yes. Did I say eight or nine? Yes. Nine, nine, ten, okay. Six. Yeah, my memory's not good. No, I don't try. I, I just, I, because I have folks that correct me, why should I try? <laughs> so six years old, uh, He's uh, out in City Park. City Park is right out in front of Islands of Adventure Universal Studios, sort of like downtown Disney. Well, thousands of folks are stopping to watch Isaac spin webs and run all over the place like Spider-Man. Now, I, I remember Mother buying me a Superman cape, and my dad had bought me a Lone Ranger outfit. I had two six-shooters on my side, a cowboy hat and some boots. <laughs> I just, I, I, I love that time, uh, the imagination of children. Now, I know now that I never was Superman or the Long Ranger, but I noticed something interesting that when I put on the clothes for that brief moment, it changed my thinking and my thinking changed my behavior.
Maybe this is why Paul chooses to use clothing as a metaphor in his letter to address the Colossians. Hallelujah. Paul writes about taking off the old self, the, the clothing of the old self, and putting in the new life of Christ. In Colossians 3, 1 through 11, Paul tells us to strip away everything that is not like God, everything from our lives that doesn't represent our new position who is with Christ, in Christ, in the heavenlies. So Paul states, take off the old clothes. And if you'll read that passage of scripture, we, we didn't read that verses 5 through 11. But Paul says, put off the old man or the old person or the flesh that Paul talks about and the deeds of the flesh so that you can put on the new self that is constantly being renewed and restored in the image of God. I love the passage that Jonathan read for us today because here Paul describes exactly what it is that we're to put on. If I don't, well, let, I, I need to be careful about what I'm about to say. Um, most of the time I dress myself, but I always make sure uh, that I get the best opinion in the house. Okay? So we're putting on exactly what it is Christ would have us to put on. Once we've stripped away all the sinfulness, the self-centeredness, and have given ourselves over completely, completely to God by becoming a follower and a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, again, as I said last Sunday, there's a warning attached. Do not try to do this or Amen. live this in the flesh. You can't do it. This is spirit led. It is spirit motivated. It Amen. is spirit given. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves, Paul says, with compassion. Uh, Jotham, could you put up that passage? I believe it's, past, it's number 12, verse 12. Can you get to it? There you go. Clothe yourself with compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Next, bear with one another. Back up. <laughs> bear with each other and forgive whatever grievance you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. And next, so also you must forgive, right? And over, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity or harmony. Well, thank you, John. Amen. This taking off the old and putting on the new that Paul describes is the essence of following Christ. Amen. Let me say that again. Taking off the old, how we used to live, how we used to respond, how we uh, used to follow the ways of the world, the old timers used to say, how we lived according to the flesh. Paul says we put that aside. By putting that aside, we put on the new. This taking off the old, putting on the new, is the essence for Paul of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You see, we renounce sin in all of its forms. We repent of our old and broken ways and how we have lived our life up to the point we accept Christ. And we turn away from that life. We turn towards the new life in Christ that is filled with grace, that is filled with love, that is filled with forgiveness, and that is filled with peace. We begin living for God, and in that process, we become more like Christ in our behavior. Because Amen. what you put on affects your thinking, and your thinking yes. will determine your behavior. Amen. Yes, Are you with true. me? Yes. Paul says in Romans 8 and 28, that we were predestined to be conformed to the likeness of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. To be conformed to the likeness of Christ, Paul says, we must clothe ourselves with Christ's nature or yes. His virtues or attributes. Glory uh, humility, to God. Humility, gentleness, forgiveness, and love, yes. patience. We could go on and on. 
So here, uh, as we consciously begin to wear Christ's likeness, as we consciously begin to put on the new nature or to break in those new clothes, Hallelujah. There's, a, there's also another warning here. You may find that they don't fit very well at first. Hallelujah. Right? <laughs> and then sometimes mm -hmm. you want to take them off. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it happens. They won't fit well at all if we try to put them on without first taking off pride mm, or anger or lying hallelujah. and the fear that marked the old life. For Christ's goodness to live in us and to fit well, Paul says we have to strip everything that connects us to the old life. Put that aside. Take it off. And, and put on the righteous garments of Jesus Christ Amen. because this is your new life. And Amen. as they become more and more a part of our life, let me say it again, it affects our thinking, it affects our speaking and doing, and we find out something else that happens along the way. Putting on these internal characteristics does something to our external behavior. If I said that once, I hope I've said it twice. I'll say it three or four more times before the message is over. Paul says, let Christ's peace rule in your heart. If Christ's peace rules in our heart, then it will certainly manifest itself in our Amen. behavior to one another. Hallelujah. Hmm. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new, new creation. creation. Yes. The old has gone, Pass. and now the new has become. Mm -hmm. And that's why it is important for us when the peace of Christ begins to take over the way that Hallelujah. we think, it rules our hearts, and yes. it will also rule our actions. Amen. Kenneth Hagin, a, a, a biblical scholar and, and commentator, wrote about this he said there is more than a functional purpose for being clothed with compassion kindness humility meekness and patience yes, Lord. bearing with one another forgiving each other binding us to each other such work is not for the faint of heart this is not conflict avoidance advice can i say that again Mm -hmm. Kenneth says, this is not conflict avoidance advice. No, no. He says, this is about what to do when bare knuckle emotional fights break out in the body of Christ. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Instead of using these, I use my emotions. Or I use my feelings. Or I manipulate the circumstances. Why? Because I want what I want. And I want to extract some level of satisfaction from seeing you squirm. Y'all don't look so holy at me. Hmm. Because they will. Bare knuckle emotional mm -hmm. disputes within the body of Christ is nothing new. They, they will happen. People whose lives are connected by a common purpose, like our lives are connected by a common purpose, such as in the body of Christ or in a church, are bound to come in conflict with each other from time to time. The question isn't if it will happen. The question is, how will we respond to that conflict as a body of Christ when it happens. Now listen, when you avoid me or others because you're angry or you disagree with me or others, it does damage Hallelujah. to the body of Christ mm. and to the witness of the people involved. Hallelujah. Because you know what happens within the body of Christ in the church when those things happen, people begin to talk about it. Talk about it. <laughs> does this make you feel uncomfortable? It does me. 
It, it, we, we, we notice those things because we notice that our brothers and sisters in Christ aren't necessarily mm -hmm. living out the biblical mandate to love one another, to bear with one another, mm -hmm. and to mm -hmm. forgive one another. It makes a difference. But not only that, when we avoid others because we're angry or we disagree, or mm -hmm. it also damages our witness to the world because the world is watching now, I know that some of you have really no idea of what's going on in denominations across the board and how that's affecting churches and how it's affecting church people. Even in our own denomination, some of you do and very aware of all of that. But I'm just wondering what kind of witness does the church have in the world whenever the people within their own body of Christ are at conflict constantly with one another. And we wonder why church attendance is down everywhere. <laughs> and people are looking for, people want to stay at home and watch it on TV. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> I wish I could do that. <laughs> Not you, but me. I mean, I, I wish I could. I, don't, I enjoy being here with you. I really do. When we confront each other with an angry spirit, with abusive language, it does damage not only to the body that we belong to, but also to our witness in the yes, world. Yes, that's true. <clears throat> that's why Paul here puts one Christ-like virtue ahead of all the others. Paul says this, above all, Above all, clothe yourselves with love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. You see, even when we disagree, as sometimes we will, speak God's truth in love. Not your truth, not your opinion, not your feelings, but God's truth in love, right? Love and respect for each other. Letting Christ's peace rule in your heart and in your mind, even in the heated emotional debates of disagreement in the body of Christ, can cause harmony and peace to rule and reign. What you put on affects your thinking. Your thinking affects your behavior and your response to other people. This is why it's so important. Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Not only we should allow the peace of Christ to rule in our hearts and minds, we are to clothe ourselves with love which binds it all together, but now let the word of God, the message of God, constantly have authority in your mind. Amen. The this change of heart, this movement from clothing ourselves in Christ to finding inward peace only happens when we immerse ourselves in the Word of God. You can't find it outside of God's Word. Does that make sense? John Coakley writes, he's another Bible commentary, uh, commentator I, I like to read. He said that the text of the Bible are not to be treated as objects. Objects to be understood, containers of ideas to be questioned or debated. Rather, they are to be taken into oneself through the whole shape of daily life. The author of Hebrews put it another way. The word of God is living and active. In Amen. Hebrews 4 and 12, sharper than any two-edged sword <coughs> piercing until it divides soul and spirit joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of a heart. Paul goes on in Timothy, 2 Timothy, he says that all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Righteousness, yes. Now, I, what I want you to do just for a moment is to keep that all in your mind because we're going to come back to that in another sermon. But I'd like to take just the rest of our time to sort of lead us in a different path. But I think that all that I've said, I hope to sort of shape your understanding of what you're about to hear. It's a true story. Mm -hmm. It happened to a pastor 
and to a district superintendent. Now let me give you just a, a little lesson in Methodism. In the Methodist Church, we are part of a conference, the Alabama West Florida Conference. How many knew that? Most of you did. We have a bishop, Bishop Graves. He's over our conference. In our conference, we have districts. We're in the Pensacola district. Each district has a district superintendent, which we call a DS for short, right? So if I say DS, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, this is a true story. A church was looking for a new pastor. And the DS, the district superintendent, is a part of his or her job. This happened to be a he. Uh, went to the church to sit down with the leaders of the church because they had called a meeting, wanted the DS to come because in recent years, they were not happy with the choice of pastors that the DS and the conference and the bishop had sent to their church, right? So he comes in and he sits down with the congregation and uh, he, uh, he began to ask a question. He sat down with the leaders to talk about what they wanted to see in their new pastor. What is the first thing that you think the church said? I bet my wife knows the answer to this. What do you want to see in a new pastor? Huh? A godly person. Well, that would be wonderful if that's actually what they said. No. They wanted a young pastor who had children so that the young pastor with the children could attract other young couples who had children. That was the first thing on the list. Someone who could attract young families. It made sense because the church had been in decline for many years and the congregation was aging. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm not, this is a true story. Now, I said, ever how you want to frame it in your own mind, that is up to you. I don't tell you how to think. This is Hallelujah. a true story. Yes. Because the pastor was mean. <laughs> the church was Fort Deposit, United Methodist Church, that wanted a young pastor right out of seminary and here in Angie and I go, it was a disaster. <laughs> Is that not correct? So the DS asked them, what is it about your church that young families would find so attractive that they would want to come? They looked at each other and they looked at the floor. Well, the DS said, what attracted you to this church when you first started to come here? Hallelujah. Well, that gave them a little pep. You know, oh, well, that, that I can answer. So one woman replied, it's the fellowship that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. This is where I see all of my friends every week, and we can catch up on each other's lives. And then one man replied, pastor, which the DS was a pastor, said, pastor, it's where I get my sense of belonging, where my friendships are formed. The DS thought for a moment, and he said, okay then, did you know that these days people who are under the age of 35 with children get that same sense of belonging and friendship building at their kids' soccer game or other sport activities. People aged 35 and under with kids, well, they build friendships with each other's parents whose kids are involved in the same thing their kids are involved in. They don't need a church for fellowship. What else you got? Well, one man said, well, church is where I get involved in helping other people. We work at the food pantry or we take a meal to the homeless shelter, and I get a lot of satisfaction out of that, Pastor. DS thought for a second. Okay. Did you know that people who are under the age of 35 do those same things? 
They just don't need a church to help them do it. Young people are involved in social justice issues, but they work through secular organizations to get that same satisfaction that you get at your church. What else do you have? Well, the room was silent. Someone coughed. I wasn't there. I'm just, that was a dramatic pause. <laughs> Finally, the DS said, what's the one thing that this church has to offer that soccer teams and social agencies could never offer? Still no answer. Okay, let's look at it this way, the DS said. The one thing this church can claim as its own is Jesus and the Word of God. Amen. Amen. If you can't show by your attitude and actions how Jesus has changed your life, if you can't express the difference of being a part of a church has made to your faith, if you can't show how following Jesus Christ as a member of this congregation has changed your life, your heart, your thoughts, your actions, and your love, and if you can't identify how Jesus has changed your life by living out Holy Scripture, what makes you think anyone else would be ever attracted to your church? And the DS was never invited back to that congregation and he sent Angie and I anyway and it didn't work just because they had a handsome couple in the parsonage with young children didn't mean anything to a world lost and dying without hope and then sin they could have cared less Sometimes it's the people in the pews <coughs> and behind the pulpit who need Jesus the most. When we put on Christ, we should look different. When we put on Christ, we should act different. When we put on Christ, we should speak different. Because we're not only wearing Christ on the outside, but we're filled with Christ on the inside, and it shows. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, Put on kindness. Put on humility and gentleness and patience. Bear with one another. And forgive one another's grievances that you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love. Amen. Which binds them all together in perfect unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace. Amen. I think that's a good place to stop. And we're going to pick back where we left off before the story. But that was just so good I had to throw it in there. I hope you heard it. I hope we heard it. And I hope the message moving forward for a lost and dying world is that by putting on Christ, it makes a difference in our church. How we love, how we forgive, and how we treat others.
Because conflict will come to the body of Christ. It's coming. I want to let you know it's coming. When something is mostly charged as a church split and what side you want to stand on, it's coming. It's coming. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and minds. Set your heart and your minds on things that are above. Because what you set your heart and mind on will dictate the behavior and our response to one another in the church. Let us pray. Build in our hearts and in our minds. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to put on the garments of Christ. The things to which Paul had expressed in Scripture rules for holy living. Clothing that we should wear. Amen. How we should think, how we should respond. Because, Lord, while the church is in conflict and we're fighting and going through a divorce, the world that is waiting for hope and for a message and for light is wondering is wondering and they're hoping and they're praying will, will we be that message will we be that light will be will we be the church that will make a difference in our world May it be so. And may your word dwell richly in the hearts and minds of the people in this congregation. I pray and ask it and hope for it. I yearn for it. I cry. I mourn for it. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church right. and in the Christ Jesus through all generations, yeah. forever and ever. Go in peace and may the peace of Christ be with you. Amen. 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 Amen.